Several years ago on Palm Sunday afternoon, my son had an emergency appendectomy. As I was leaving the service that Sunday, my wife was trying to get hold of me, telling me to hurry up because they were taking him back for surgery, and I barely got there in time before they rolled him back. Came through the surgery well, and because he was the only surgery that afternoon, they allowed Jeannie and me to go sit with, with Chris in the recovery room. And so we're walking across the recovery room. He sees us coming and he motions for me to come over. And I'm thinking, oh, great. This is going to be one of those great father-son moments, you know. And I lean down and he pushes the oxygen mask over and goes, you lied to me. <laughs> no, not exactly. You are going to get better, just not today. It gets worse before it gets better. That's one of those truisms of life. It's something we all know. Uh, I have friends who love to play golf, and so they want to get better playing golf. They take lessons. They get worse. You have to unlearn everything you have learned about playing golf badly and wrongly, and now you have to learn an entirely different way of, 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 of playing golf. And it takes sometimes months. I have friends who have quit because they started taking lessons. I would find them and say, hey, I thought you loved golf. No, I hate it. I started taking lessons and I hate it. It, is, it gets worse before it gets better. You, you finally make the New Year's resolution. You're going to lose weight. You're going to get in shape. You're going to treat yourself better. And you go to the gym and, and you hurt all the time. You're doing this to feel better. But you don't feel better. It gets worse before it gets better. One of the reasons that I trust scriptures is not only does it tell me the truth about God, but it tells me the truth about life. Uh, it tells us about how it is to live in the world and what the ups and downs are and what you will encounter if you try to live faithfully. And one of the things that the Bible tells us is, listen, it gets worse before it gets better. So Moses learns in the fifth chapter of Exodus. Stand, so stand with me now in honor of God's word as we pick up in the middle of the conversation. And that day Pharaoh commanded the overseers of the people as well as their foremen, don't continue to supply the people with straw for making bricks as before. They must go now and gather straw for themselves, but require the same quota of bricks from them as they, as they were making before. Do not reduce it, for they are slackers. That is why they're crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Impose heavier work on them, and they will be occupied with it and pay no attention to the deceptive words. Require the same quota of bricks as before. Do not reduce it, for they are slackers. That is why they're saying, let us go and make sacrifice to our God. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. In those moments, O oh Lord, when it gets worse before it gets better, give us courage to hang in there and give us the faith to know it does get better. We pray this in your name. Amen. Oh, well, now the book of Exodus is about to get serious. Let's remember where we are. At the end of Genesis, Joseph brings his entire family to live in Egypt. All of his brothers and the, and the Hebrews thrive in Egypt. So much so that they become a perceived threat to, to Egypt. And the Pharaoh, who doesn't remember Joseph, doesn't remember what happened when Joseph was there, enslaves them. They thrive in slavery, and because the Hebrews weren't broken by the slavery, then the Pharaoh ratches it up, and he says, okay, what we want to do now is kill every baby that's born a male, and we'll turn the nation of Israel into a nation of women. And that happens, except to one couple, a, a, a woman who was the daughter of a Levi and a husband who was the son of Levi's, of the, uh, of the Levitical tribe, priest at what will become the, the, the priest tribe, and they protect their baby, and they hold him as long as they can. When they can't, they devise a plan, and the mother slides uh, Moses in a basket under the nose of Pharaoh's daughter. 
She opens the basket, sees the beautiful baby boy, wants to adopt him. Miriam, his sister who's been watching, steps out of the weeds and says, listen, I'll find a mother for the little baby and we'll bring him back to you when he's older. Pharaoh's daughter agrees and Moses' mother raises him. He is given later to Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's daughter. He becomes a son of Pharaoh's daughter, and through that, a son of Pharaoh, and he's raised to be an Egyptian ruler, an Egyptian bureaucrat. One day, as an older man, while he is walking, he sees an Egyptian overseer beating a Hebrew slave. He intervenes, kills the Egyptian overseer. Word gets out, Pharaoh tries to find him so that Pharaoh can kill Moses, and Moses runs into the wilderness. There he comes across a group of bullies who is uh, hassling a group of, of women and their sheep. Once again, Moses intervenes, runs the bullies off, and there he meets his father-in-law and all his father-in-law's daughters and marries one of them. Now, things are looking good for Moses. It's not great, but it's not bad. Okay, maybe things are not the way that we dreamed and hoped they would be, but you know, this isn't too bad. Sometimes you end up in life like that, don't you? It's not where you started out, but it's a lot worse, it's a lot better than where you could have ended up. Not bad. So Moses, it looks like, is going to end up with a not bad life, but then one day while keeping his father-in-law's sheep, he sees the burning bush, steps over to see what's going on, and there he is confronted with the living God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he hears that God is going to rescue the Hebrews out of Egyptian slavery. Yay! And you're going to go do it, Moses. No! So there's a long discussion between God and Moses about Moses finally going. God gives Moses several signs. And then he is sent with his brother Aaron. And Moses and Aaron go confront Pharaoh. So they go to Pharaoh, and they said the famous words, God said, let my people go that they may go into the wilderness and worship me. And Pharaoh goes, mm, don't think so. No. No, and, and in fact, no, no to the point that if you have time to go off and worship, then you have time to get your own straw. So we're not going to bring you straw anymore. Uh, the way the bricks were made is it was mud and straw, and the straw held the mud together. And so you had to have enough straw to hold the bricks together, and the bricks would dry. And that's the way the bricks were made for all of Pharaoh's construction projects. So if you've got time that you want to go worship, then you've got time to get the straw on your own. So he tells the Egyptian overseers, don't waste your time giving the, the Hebrews straw. They can get it on their own, but do not release the quota one brick. Make bricks without straw. Make bricks without straw. And now everybody hates Moses. We didn't ask you to come rescue us. We were fine. And here you are coming from who knows where, telling us his story about who knows what, and now You've gone told Pharaoh to let us go. He's mad. Now we don't have any straw for the bricks, but we got to come up with the same number of bricks. You're no help at all. But what did you expect to happen? Did you really expect that Pharaoh would look at Moses and go, sure. We'll just have a long weekend. Y'all go worship, come back Tuesday, and we'll pick up with a slavery thing. Did you really expect Pharaoh to roll over the first time he was confronted? Honestly? Yeah, we kind of did. Listen, Moses had that same kind of theology that a lot of us have, right? If you're following Jesus, if you're loving God, then everything works out. Everything's good in your life. If you love Jesus, you can always find a parking place. <laughs> right? The IRS always owes you money. It's just good to follow Jesus. Right? And I told you several years ago when I was diagnosed with cancer, I, I, I told you one of, one of my problems was I thought Jesus had broken the deal. And the deal is I put up with all of you and nothing bad happens to me. That's the deal.
You think that too, don't you? You think if you're doing what Jesus wants you to do, and you know you're following what He's leading you to do, that things ought to work. Things should not get worse, but they do. Why? Because we have an enemy. And when you start doing something good for Jesus, Jesus isn't the only one who notices. And the world will turn against you. Now, what do we do in that moment? One, we expect it. You're not surprised by it. Okay, why are we not surprised? Jesus said this is what would happen. You remember the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount? Right? This chapter 5 in, in, in Matthew. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. We love them. They're beautiful. You know the next paragraph? That we always stop when we get down to the hard part. The next part? Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil falsely against you for the sake of my name. Blessed are you because this is the way they treated the prophets before you. Blessed are you when the world turns against you. Paul, he told Timothy, suffer as a good soldier. It gets harder before it gets better. Peter and John preaching the gospel. They're arrested several times. They're, they're abused several times. The last time they're beaten because the religious and political leaders didn't know what else to do with them. And they are released. And Peter and John leave celebrating that they were found worthy to suffer for the name. Now, I haven't been beaten up much in my life. I have been beaten up a few times, and I never left one of those beatings celebrating. Not once. But listen, we live in a world that is turning against the Christian message that they've turned against Jesus, don't be surprised when they turn against you. Celebrate that they recognize that you're on His team. Some of us want to fit into the crowd, and we don't want to be found out as a Christian. And the problem with that, the world can't find us. They don't realize that we're a Christian, and neither does Jesus. If you deny me in front of men, Jesus says, I'll deny you in front of the Father. If you don't want to be known as one of my fathers, uh, followers, I won't claim you as one in front of my Father. So what do we do? One, we expect it. This is what Jesus said would happen. So when it happens, we're not surprised, we're not caught off guard. This is what Jesus told us would happen too. We prepare for it. As the old preachers say, you get prayed up, you get studied up, you get in the Word so you know how God's working, how you know how He thinks, so you know how He does things, so you know how life is. So when, you, when, you, when you're in that situation, you know what to do next. You expect it. You get prepared for it, and you toughen up. Do you realize how much of the spiritual walk is, is described in terms of warfare? Put on the full armor of God. Warfare. If this is a hard way to go because, well, let me explain it to you. When you are in disobedience, when you're not paying attention to what God is telling you about your life, you're going with the flow of culture, right? Everything flows downhill. So you got a pretty good, you, you, you picked up some pretty good speed, but everything's flowing with you and you're going downhill, all right? Now you decide, I want to follow Jesus. Well, that's repent, which means you turn. And instead of flowing with culture, you're, sta you're standing against culture. You're going into the current. Everything that was flowing with you is now flowing at you. It gets harder. 
but it gets better. How do I say? How, why, why don't I say that? What, what gives me that confidence? Can't, can't you see what's going on? Can't you see what Pharaoh's done? You see, this is not a conversation between Pharaoh and Moses. This is a conversation between Pharaoh and God. And Pharaoh is not telling Moses, he's telling God, the Hebrews do not belong to you, they belong to me. I'll tell them when to get up. I'll tell them when to sit down. I'll tell them how many bricks they have to do. I'll tell them how many days they have to do it. They belong to me. Pharaoh is gone. He's the son of Ra, son of the sun. Not you. And we end up making bricks without straw. It's funny, isn't it? Phrases in the Bible that everybody knows. Making bricks without straw is one of them. And we live in a culture that demands more and more of us, but provides less and less support. How many of you are in offices now that have less employees than when you started there? But the same amount of work is required, making bricks without straw. I can remember, I'm old enough, this is hilarious, when computers were time-saving devices. <laughs> I'm not making this up. They were writing in scholarly journals and in business journals, the leading journals of the day, worried about what we were going to do with all of our spare time. That's the truth. What are we going to do with all our spare time? Now we're hearing the same kind of lie about artificial intelligence, AI. What are we going to do when the machines are running everything? <laughs> right. Right. So your boss gave you a computer. Now you can do the work of two people but he's going to pay one. And when you go home, boss ain't going to let you alone. He's got you on an electronic leash. Bzz, bzz. And if that doesn't get you, the boss will strap it to your wrist. Bzz, bzz. <laughs> You're working longer hours, getting less done. You come home in the evening, there's no time for family, there's barely time for you. Saturday, oh, that's time for the kids. Uh, we, go, we play soccer, baseball, uh, basketball, uh, lacrosse, we have dance, we have, uh, uh, that's all day Saturday. Sunday's the only day we have. That's our day of recreation. So we fill it up with football games and hockey games and on and on the list goes. Do you know another pronunciation for recreation is recreation? I've seen some of you on Monday, you don't look recreated. <laughs> because Pharaoh doesn't want you to worship. The cure for burnout isn't rest. The cure for burnout is worship. Worship is the moment when you realize it doesn't count on me. It doesn't depend on me. Sun came up this morning. Did it check with you? Nope. Going to go down this evening. Will not ask my permission. The world will attend to its orbit. The stars will stay in their place. And not one of that is dependent on me. Worship is the time where you remember that God is God and we're not. Isn't that good news? Every day you're told, boy, if you don't get this done, the whole world's going to fall apart. No, it won't. How many times have you heard just in the past week that, that if Christianity doesn't do something, the church is going to disappear from the world? Really? We've lived through Rome, we've lived through Ger uh, Germany, we've lived through Russia, we've lived through China, we'll live through this. I can just see the meeting now where God, looking at all the angels, said, you know, I thought we had a chance, but then Mike didn't believe him. 
and blew everything. Come on. Worship is the moment when you realize it doesn't depend on you, and it's remembering when you realize that you are loved. You didn't do anything to deserve it. You didn't do anything to earn it. He loves you because He created you in His image, and He created you for a relationship with Him. It's, when, it's where you are known. And I know some of you are scared to death that Jesus is going to know about that last stupid thing you did. Some of you haven't prayed since you did that last stupid thing because you're scared to death Jesus is going to bring it up. Can I help you? Okay. He already knows. Okay. So since He knows and you know, you need to get together and work that out. I am known and loved anyway. I am given a purpose. I am invited to work with him and his kingdom work in our world, and he's invited me to come along. He doesn't need me, doesn't need you, but he wants us. And that is so much better. And you're here. Now, worship isn't that you attend a certain time, a certain moment. Okay, don't run up to me afterwards and go, boy, that was a great sermon. I wish my friend had been here because they never come to worship. Uh -uh. Worship is about the, out, the attitude of life that everything is focused Godward. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe He has been raised from the dead. I believe He paid for my sins. I believe He's Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Everything in my life is oriented to that reality. Paul said, whatever you do, you do it as to the Lord. You make the simplest act of your life an act of worship and praise because Pharaoh will tell us it's going to get worse. It does. But God reminds us in worship, it gets better. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm not going to do anything to put you on the spot. You know, we don't work that way here. I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out. For some of you here, you're in the middle of this. You're being faithful to Jesus as best you can. You've confirmed His will in your life every way you know how. And right now, it's just hard. Nothing is going right. This is just a word of encouragement. Yeah, it gets harder before it gets better. But it does get better. For some of you, it's a time to come be part of this church family. The Lord has confirmed that these are the people I want you working with. This is the place I want you to be. And our friends are waiting for you right now at the table that says next steps. Let us help you get that process started. And some of you, it's the first time you thought about a relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't even know what that means. You don't know what it means that he died on the cross for you or what it means that he was raised from the dead. The only thing you've got is questions. That's fine. We don't expect you to have it all figured out. Our friends are waiting for you too at that table. It says, next step. Just go and say, hey, I want to know more about what Mike was talking about. They'll pick up the conversation from there. But I beg you, don't leave this moment with those questions unanswered. Lord Jesus, every life is open before you, every heart. So we pray now the choices we make are exactly what you